we tend to remember uh, the dates that our family members have died, mostly our parents, but sometimes our siblings or even our children in some tragic circumstances. Uh, they're sort of marked in our calendars of days of death, just like days of birth are also marked in our calendar. Uh, days of birth we celebrate much more. We have um, parties every year when you're in, when, as you're growing up. Uh, they tend to sort of die down after a while, I've noticed. Um, I wouldn't mind a few parties on my birthday, but, you know, that's about some time ago. Uh, and so in the Christian calendar, Jesus' birthday, of course, Christmas, and the date of Jesus' death this Friday, this Good Friday, gives us pause to reflect and remember what was this death all about? In the passage we had read from Luke's Gospel, prior to Jesus' death, we saw actually in that lovely drawing uh, that Sandy was speaking to for, for the children, but also for the adults, uh, you saw the way in which Pilate had, had uh, condemned uh, Jesus to death. He had him flogged first and then he's put up on a cross. He can't even carry his own cross. He's so weary and beleaguered and unable to uh, even lift that cross. And then he's nailed to that cross. In the Roman world, crucifixion was the worst of punishments and the most cruel of punishments. A person was hung up. Uh, on a cross, sometimes the hands were bound, sometimes they were uh, nailed as Jesus' hands were nailed to the cross and his feet to the, to the mainstay of the cross. And you would be on that cross for hours and eventually die of asphyxiation, unable to breathe. And sometimes the bodies would be left there for the crows to pick at as carcass food. But Luke doesn't give us a description of the crucifixion and the suffering and the physical aspects of it, he actually gives us conversations at the cross. Conversations which give us a deeper insight as to what Jesus was doing there. He's taken out to the skull, the place of the skull. Even the skull is sort of a, a picture of death. This is long before the uh, skull and crossbones of pirates. The skull is that symbol of a, of a fleshless cranium in a skeleton form which pictures death. And Jesus is taken out with two criminals on either side. We first hear Jesus speak. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Pretty impressive, isn't it? That here in the midst of his physical suffering and in the context of his spiritual suffering, Jesus seeks the forgiveness of those who are crucifying him. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Ignorance is no excuse in the Bible. But those who know God and reject him, there's a greater punishment than those who don't know him and reject him. For these people who did not know what they were doing, they thought they were just crucifying a criminal, an insurrectionist, a person who was going to destabilise the Roman government. That was their concern. The Jews, of course, didn't want this... Uh, this so-called Messiah, this pretender, to have any vantage point at all, to have no oxygen. Let's get rid of him off the scene. He's disturbing out the natural course of the way in which we're doing things in the temple and in the Jewish leadership. Two different reasons to get rid of Jesus. But they did not realise that God was in their midst. God in the flesh was among them. And they were crucifying God. And the Son of God prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke then makes reference to the fact they divided 
his clothes among them by casting lots among the soldiers. This, of course, is a reference to Psalm 22, written 1,000 years before the events at Golgotha, where David had seen the same situation for him, and they divided clothes and cast lots. When he was under pressure and under turmoil, and yet in a wonderful way predicting the sufferings of the Messiah to come, and now Jesus was there. In other words, this was no accident. This did not catch God by surprise. This did not catch Jesus by surprise. It caught the disciples by surprise. I suppose the 12 disciples, or 11 at this stage, uh, were probably the greatest example of the group of slowest learners we've ever had in history. Uh, many times Jesus had talked about the fact he was going to suffer and die and raise on the third day, and it just hadn't sunk in. This was no accident. This was God's perfect plan. Because Jesus' name means saviour. His purpose was to come and to save. If there had been any other way to save us than by his living under God's law and dying under God's law, then he'd have done it. But there was no other way for God's justice to be maintained and for God's love to be expressed, Jesus, the Saviour, had to die. He had to endure the penalty that belonged to his people. He had to live the life that we could not live and die the death that we deserve. There are three, three groups of people now who start to mock Jesus. Uh, their mockery is in a scaling down in status. First we have the rulers and the rulers sneer at him. They said, he saved others, uh, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the Messiah of God, the chosen one. You can hear the mockery in their voice. The Sanhedrin had also said much the same thing in his trial, if you are the Christ, Tell us. Satan had put the same challenge. If you are God's son, turn this stone into bread. Again, these sneering challenges have become more vindictive. But notice that he says he saved others. Uh, the word save actually can also encompass heal. They'd seen or heard of stories of Jesus healing. Well, if you're such a good healer, heal yourself. Save yourself. Bring yourself down from the cross if you're so powerful, if you're so wonderful, if you're the chosen one, if you're the true king, the anointed one. That's what Messiah means, the anointed king. Do so. Next were the soldiers. And the soldiers in the same vindictive, scornful, mocking manner said much the same. And they, and they said to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. You can feel the irony of saving once from the rulers, then from the soldiers. Here the title king of Jews, which was put over the cross by the Romans against the Jewish ruler's desires. He pretended to be the king of Jews, but what kind of king is he? Pathetic, crucified, crumpled, there in all his weakness, wounded, unable to save. From the rulers to the soldiers, we come to the criminal on his side. The criminal who you'd have thought should have just been hung there, but he wants to join in the mockery. And he joins in too. And what does he say? He says, 
Aren't you the Messiah? Huh. Well, then save yourself and us, by the way. So saving has come here in a way in which it has been exemplified in Jesus' name and now it seemed to be completely devoid of meaning. The irony is that barely a week beforehand on what we call Palm Sunday, Jesus had come into Jerusalem on a donkey, just like Solomon had entered Jerusalem when he became king on a donkey. And what do the people cry out? Hosanna! And what does Hosanna mean? Save us. This is the king. The expectation was high. The excitement was at an all-time level. The king is coming. Just like Solomon, David's son is coming. And this is David's greater son. But what disappointment there was for the crowds. They did not realise what kind of kingship he had. They did not realise how he would save to fulfil those acclamations of Hosanna. They thought he would overturn the Romans, just like he'd overturned the tables in the temple. They thought he would establish the kingship once and for all in Jerusalem, and that was not what he came to do, but he came to die. And he would establish his kingdom in his death so that when he would come back as king, all would bow the knee. Save us and yourself, says the criminal. But there were two criminals that day. And the one on the other side spoke firstly to his fellow criminal. Why are you speaking like that? You're under the same sentence. Don't you fear God? Don't you understand that we're here because we deserve to be here? We know we've done wrong. But this man has done nothing wrong. Here in the insight that this fellow criminal has, or this fellow crucified one expresses, he recognises that Jesus has done nothing wrong. The two criminals on either side of Jesus had no doubt gone through a process of trial. In due order, Jesus had had a mock trial. False witnesses had come. Perhaps the criminal had heard of Jesus in the last three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, or maybe he'd heard of him in the cell the night before. Whatever, he sees Jesus as the one who is righteous, the one who has done nothing wrong. As the Apostle Paul would say later in one of his letters, he who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus' death was not just a tragic crucifixion like so many in the first century. In Jesus' death, he was bearing the judgment of God upon his people in that body on the tree. And there he drank damnation dry. Jesus had done nothing wrong. Jesus could have taken himself off that cross, called a legion of angels to deliver him. But this was what his task was. This was what he wanted to do, his father's will. And this criminal on one side recognises who Jesus is. And then he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Notice he recognises Jesus as king. He's going to come into his kingdom. But notice this, that the 
the criminal calls Jesus by his first name. Nowhere else in the gospel does anyone call Jesus just by the name Jesus. The disciples call him master or rabbi. There are two occasions when demon-possessed people call out Jesus, son of the most high. There's Jesus with a title. Or the blind man says, Jesus, son of David. But to call the son of God merely by his name, his given name, Jesus, saviour, is unique in Luke's gospel. It shows the confidence this man has in addressing Jesus. Have you ever realised what a great privilege it is to call God's son by his first name? We so easily take it for granted. I can't imagine when, if Queen Elizabeth were to come back to Australia, she's not likely to do it to now at her great age, but if she came and said, oh, hi, Liz, how are you? <laughs> you wouldn't do that kind of thing, would you? I mean, some people have titles like Archbishop. <laughs> you never know not what to call them, do you, really? Uh, but my first name is Glenn. That's my Christian name. And you can call me Glenn because I'm a brother in Christ in the same family as you. And where Jesus invites us to call him by his first name. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus turns to him. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. What? Words of comfort for that criminal. A criminal who is now forgiven. What does he bring before Jesus? No merit, no list of good works, no sense of achievements, no pedigree, no history, no good education. He brings to him nothing other than a request asked in faith, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And because the gospel is all about grace, Jesus doesn't turn to him and say, well, what have you done that you deserve to enter into my kingdom? Give me your list of achievements. Tell me what school you went to. Tell me who your father's name is. Nothing. Because to enter God's kingdom is to enter by grace, the work of Jesus. Jesus' death on our behalf. Jesus' life on our behalf. So Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise is a Persian word for garden. It reflects back to the Garden of Eden or the Garden of God, as Ezekiel describes it. And here, Jesus is saying, when you die, you're going to be with me today. Sharon's mother is a believer, so I understand. And I, and I talk with many people whose loved ones have died. They often ask, where are they now? I know their body's in the grave, but where are they now? And the answer that Jesus gives this criminal is, in paradise, with me. Sharon's mother is with Jesus now because of what Jesus has done for her and because she responded to God's invitation. The rupture of body and soul that takes place in death is what Jesus experienced. 
on that Good Friday night, that first Good Friday, he delivered up his spirit to the Father in the following verses in this chapter. Into your hands I commend my spirit. His body lay there lifeless, placed in a tomb, but his human spirit was with his heavenly Father, as was the human spirit of that thief alongside when he died. Jesus would then experience the reunification of body and spirit in a resurrection form on Easter Day, three days later. The criminal, the f repentant, forgiven criminal, is awaiting his resurrection body as all who have died in Christ. And that great day is still on the horizon. That's why the saints cry out in Revelation, how long, O Lord? They're waiting for their resurrection bodies. They're waiting for God, for God's Son, the King, to return and wrap up this old world. But they're waiting in joy, in paradise, in anticipation, waiting for us to join them. Jesus' promise Today you'll be with me in paradise is true for each and every one of us on the day of our death. The very prayer that Jesus prayed at the beginning of this section, forgive them, has now come true for this repentant criminal. We're either on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side of Jesus. Because we all have sins that deserve judgment. None of us can present to God a platter of our good works. The question is, are we going to be the mocking, jeering, rejecting criminal? Are we going to stand there on our own two feet, as it were, declaring Jesus is of no importance to me? Jesus is, has no relevance to me? Or are we going to turn and say, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom? To understand Good Friday is to understand the Saviour who is truly King. We live in a society where people will just spend their Good Friday doing whatever they want to do without giving Jesus' death one moment's thought. But they do that to their peril. This morning, if you have not asked Jesus to remember you, asked him to remember you when he comes in his kingdom, if you haven't had the confidence to call the Son of God by his first name, then today is a day to do so. What better day Move from one side to the other, from the rejecting of Jesus to the acceptance of Jesus, to the submission to Jesus, to the delight in Jesus, so that your sins may be forgiven and the joy of paradise and ultimately the new heavens and the new earth when Jesus returns in all his glory and all those who have died in Christ with him and we shall be forever with the Lord. Today, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are amazed at your great love for us. But before the world was created, you loved us with an everlasting love. We thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to be our Saviour and our King. And through his death on that cross, he died for us. Father, I pray that if we have not embraced this truth, that by your Holy Spirit you would imprint it in our hearts today and that we would accept Jesus and receive the forgiveness of sins and the invitation to be with you in paradise and to dwell with you forever. Amen.